you okay rashmi ji yeah 130 okay yes we are live live yeah you can start could we start yeah yeah good evening everybody in india and good afternoon in uk uh, my name is akanksha and i am representing iaw here today which stands for inspiring indian women a little bit about uh, uh, the organization we work towards women empowerment and i know a lot of you have already visited our page and we know the kind of work we do uh, i really welcome you a very warm welcome everybody uh, on this platform today this chat show that is uh, which is uh, hosted mostly uh, by my colleague uh, dr grishma but today when i was asked to host uh, the show i was like okay but then the moment i got to know about the guest today we are having and uh, the subject uh, we are touching today i there was no uh, single thought about it i was like i am going for it uh, because that's one subject which is very close to my heart as well as uh, that's one topic which i also uh, contribute towards my organization so uh, to welcome my guest i have few uh, uh, things to say on her introduction so uh, she is hailing from mumbai in india has worked over a decade and a half in the corporate sector across borders her double masters from a foreign university gave her tools for a career for a career but uh, her personal life experience gave her tools for life the setback of an abusive marriage post separation abuse and a messy divorce and a result which resulted a trauma have been game changer for her it took a while but on her healing journey she has found herself learn to thrive and found her life's purpose aarti ji is now invested in practicing as a domestic abuse coach aarti ji is now working as a domestic abuse coach and helping a lot of women out, out there she vehemently advocates the word survivor over victim which i have also learned from her yesterday because me uh, being a, a lawyer or from a legal background we tend to call uh, a survivor a victim sometime but she uh, made me correct that that let us start calling them a survivor so really thank you for that uh, she is on a mission uh, to heal survivors on domestic abuse to regain balance and find their inner strength interestingly aarti ji pursues her coaching work regardless of the survivor's gender or geography because of her views abuse as a crime is against humanity that doesn't see as a gender if it is a woman or a man it is a crime for the humanity interestingly <clears throat> aarti ji feels gratitude uh, gratified to see survivors transition from toxic relationship while supporting them to shape a future of their choice so now i will start the chat show by asking you aarti ji and first of all a very warm welcome thank you so much for doing this for us and inspiring a lot of women out there i know you are already doing it but i am sure today a lot of us will get inspired after this uh, chat show we will learn a lot of uh, things our rights and probably everybody would have a a a different perspective after this chat show today so a very warm welcome to you thank you akansha ji thank you so much and my immense gratitude to you and iiw for having uh, invited me to the platform i am delighted i am delighted more because uh, this subject is very sensitive as all of us know it i'm also delighted that finally we are talking about it on a very large platform that serves humanity that serves not just women serves the cause serves humanity so much so that it is probably our time to do something about it and uh, again gratitude that you gave me this opportunity to speak thank today 
Thank, Thank you, you so much. So I would start the session by asking you, uh, who is a coach actually? And how does it, how do they help? And how are they actually different uh, from, let's say, a psychiatrist or maybe a counselor? What is the, I am sure there must be a very thin line, but what is actually the difference and who are the coaches? Sure, thank you for that question. I think we're off to a great start. Uh, this is uh, quite an illusion a lot of the times that coaches are psychologists and psychiatrists or the other way around. And in India, particularly, the definition of a coach is not very clearly understood because as an industry, it is not as uh, old as it has been in the Western world. So knowing about coaches, knowing what coaches do itself is a kind of awareness that we need to build. So thank you for that question. Uh, a coach and a psychologist or a psychiatrist have actually a lot of differences. Uh, and we could probably have an hour's discussion only on that. But as you said, it's a thin line. So just let's focus on what these couple of big differences are so that our audience get clear about what we're talking about, what a coach can do. So see, essentially, a psychiatrist or a psychologist have university degrees. If you purely go by credentials and the field has been fairly old, uh, in, uh, on, in the world, on the planet as such. Uh, a coach does not necessarily need uh, a degree because there doesn't exist one. Although coaches do have specific certifications and coaches essentially work on messages. Uh, what is the kind of message that I'm talking about? So a coach, again, is different from psychologist or a, psychi a psychiatrist, depending on the message that they have to give to the world or the gift that they have to give to the world. Um, a coach essentially, like I said, works on their experience and works on their niche, which means to say that even a, a certification, even added to a certification, what a coach would do is make their mess a message or their pain, their purpose. So as much as uh, I have done that, uh, I used my experience of domestic abuse, my learnings from domestic abuse and created a niche to be able to serve people. While anybody is welcome to my room for coaching, I specialize in coaching for domestic abuse survivors, men or women. However, if you go to understand something about a psychologist or a psychiatrist, they will actually offer therapy to anyone. They don't necessarily have to work on a niche. The other big difference is that uh, coaches do not address mental health problems. In fact, if there is a mental health problem that has been diagnosed, typically uh, a coach would should, in fact, uh, refer them to refer their uh, coaches or prospective coaches to psychologists or psychiatrists who might uh, administer medic medication. Psychiatrists particularly would administer medication. Coaches do not do that. Co coaches do not have a medical degree, while coaches may be trained as a therapist as well. So there can be people who can do both the roles, but the clear distinction is that they don't, do, not, do not address mental health problems. Okay. One of the other key differences is that coaches are forward looking. Coaches work on the future of their coaches. Coaches work on goals and not necessarily on the past. The past serves as information or data only to work on the future. And essentially I would say a coach, um, uh, you know, at the end of it all, the bottom line is the coach is and should be someone who's a cheerleader and a confidant to their coaches and expect that the solutions come from the coaches themselves rather than administer advice. Okay. So if that helps, uh, that's a yeah. short answer to some clear distinctions. But Akansha, I have lost your video. My video? Yes. Okay. Yeah, now you're back. Now you're back. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So I hope that helps. Yes, yes, definitely. And uh, to the extension of, as you mentioned, that you have, I mean, I would call you a survivor or you have experienced a certain things in life. So extension to that particular thing, uh, would you mind uh, talking about it and uh, share your experience to, uh, to a smaller scale, whichever uh, way uh, that suits you? Would you like to uh, share something about that? Your sure. personal experience? Sure, um, I'll only scratch the surface on it, yes. uh, uh, whatever is not too disturbing, uh, but yes, um, to be able to give you a sense of the abuse that I, I experienced, uh, which of course I discovered much later, that it is abuse, 
I also discovered the kind of personality that I had been married to. So all of these things I was too naive towards. I had not known, I had not studied, I was not advised. And I don't think any one of us usually are advised. We're always advised the good things of life when we get married. Um, I uh, got married into a family that had a lot of narcissistic or psychopathic kind of behaviors. And I say that particularly for the family as well, not just for my ex-husband. Um, faced a lot of uh, emotional, mental, psychological, if you call it mental stroke, psychological, and immense financial abuse. So uh, there was a time when I felt completely cornered about uh, my thoughts and feelings as well, let alone even expressing them or even uh, having a say in anything. Um, to give you an example of what I'm saying, till the time I was married and for a longish time after that, and even today, and not that it matters today, I didn't even know how much my ex-husband earned as a salary or a compensation. Um, I had no idea about our future. The promises that were made before the marriage uh, were not fulfilled. And in fact, they, life on a daily basis got troublesome and more troublesome because information was being withheld. I was isolated uh, from family and friends. Uh, I was physically intimidated and threatened very many times. And all of this, uh, like I said, I would only scratch the surface of certain examples to give you an idea about a lot of examples that could possibly exist in people's lives, but they don't recognize them. Yes, correct. Uh, so if I take a step back, I can say that I could see the red flags even before I got married. Okay. But you see, uh, we all come from different spaces in life. We do things, and I firmly believe that, whether they are mistakes or not, I firmly believe that we do take decisions based on the knowledge and wisdom we have at the time. And it's fine. A mistake made is made, but living with that mistake is a mistake, a it's very big one. A bigger, bigger mistake. Yes, a, a, a bigger mistake. Thank you. And uh, that's why uh, when I started to realize and I started to understand that my ex-husband's potential mental health issues were hidden away from me as well, and that was impacting our married life, uh, I started to feel fearful and scared about my future, uh, about a potential family's future. And uh, one thing after the other led to uh, the decision that uh, the marriage is not worth investing in anymore. So that was my experience. And on uh, that note, I would really like to add on a small thing, really more power to you. And we really need a more courageous women like you in India, because unfortunately, or fortunately, maybe because of our culture, or maybe India being a very cultured uh, country, we have been actually taught uh, since the beginning because a lot of us, as you very well said, that we don't know if it is an abusive relationship or not because some of us have actually grown up seeing this and things have been very normalized uh, for the people in India. So it takes a lot of, lot of courage. And I know things are uh, changing now. Women are taking a charge of their life. Uh, they they uh, have the courage to decide if they want to be in the relationship or not, and which is very important. And that's one thing we all are trying to do here, because uh, sometimes we also, when we uh, as a personally, when we handle uh, cases of uh, you know uh, survivors or uh, victims, whoever you know you call them, they call us uh, for the help they sometimes do not want a solution. They just want a person who would listen to them. And there are such small, small things which they would even not realize that these are problems. And they have been going through all of this until unless we pinpoint them, tell them what their rights are. So actually, yes, this, this is a very uh, sensitive and an important topic and it should be talked about. We all should talk about it. So, uh, Ardiji, how have you actually come out of this? When was the time when you took a charge of your life and you decided, no, that is it? I am, I am sure it must have been very, very uh, difficult because as a woman, I as a woman, as a married woman, as a mother, I can understand it is, 
it's not easy you have so much of baggage baggage of parents baggage of family social baggage kids what will happen to my kids it is a difficult call to take so if you can just throw some light on that how did you get that courage to you know decide that this is it i'm not going to tolerate it and i am stepping out of this marriage right so uh, it took me a while to make the decision of stepping out of the marriage in fact i was abandoned long before it was only on paper that uh, i think the decision had to be made or signed off on actually but i think i was not welcomed anymore uh, all those experiences were already there it was just about like how you do a marriage registration you do a divorce and that's about it but your feelings don't change on paper right your feelings don't change because you've signed off on something yes of course so the decision to it was not necessarily to walk away from the marriage but the decision was based on something very dear to me uh, that i hold dear even today because that decision was a game changer for me uh, for the rest of my life as well i decided that my children would not have a narcissistic father they don't deserve one maybe i didn't deserve a narcissistic husband as well but then a mistake made is made i would be doing this service to my unborn children uh, when they are born if i bring him bring them into this world having a father like that i was extremely sure about that part i think i was less concerned about myself than i was concerned about uh, what would happen to the future of my kids and that one thought that one thought gave me the strength to uh, decide what was needed in that situation and what was needed was to continue to work on the marriage actually okay which i did okay. and when i saw that things weren't working out uh, there was a physical separation for a while and when i realized that there was any ways this uh, feeling of being unwelcomed and more post separation abuse that i was experiencing uh, it was a dead end it was a dead end the, the marriage really didn't have a future if you feel unwelcome in a relationship yes uh so yeah that's about it so the i think it was a very natural progression to the future of the marriage itself but it was those unborn children that gave me the courage to do this that's a very interesting point actually because a lot of us uh, sometime feel that it is my kids why am i in this marriage right because people and we women as we think are other way round you have actually given us a very different perspective i know a lot of us i am uh, no one to judge including me uh, some set of people might think uh, the way you are thinking that you know i don't want my kids to be Uh, around somebody who is not respectful towards their mother who doesn't mm -hmm. uh, i mean there is no guarantee if the person is not good enough for me how i mean if he is not successful as a as a husband what i mean what will he do to my kids so but a lot of us uh, sometimes feel no it is because of my kids i am into this relationship what will happen to their future that's right. Out, right that's right that's right akansh and there's another angle to it a lot of uh, cultural conditioning is also that yes. have kids so that the relationship can improve yes and yes. Uh, i didn't much see yes. sense in no, that no, yeah, correct that is why i think we all uh, the first thing uh, that's my personal opinion it has a lot of uh, uh, thing to uh, uh, take as as you being a independent women that's why they say that you know you uh should be a, a no i mean if you are educated well well and good but the women should be financially independent that plays a very important role for a woman to take that stand uh, for them for, for themselves yes. so yeah uh, really i i really appreciate ati ji i Thank know you. it takes a lot of courage to Thank you. speak about uh, such things that to on a on a platform which is in a public forum but it 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 is going to help a lot of women because we see uh, you as a inspiration i was going through when i was i got to know that uh, i'll be hosting the show so as my homework i was going through your uh, website and i really really uh, appreciate you the kind of uh, work you are doing because 
see one thing is uh, being a professional coach or being a, a you know a, a degree lawyer or something but when somebody have experienced a similar kind of a situation in life he or she can understand it better they can actually give their heart and soul to the person you can resonate more if you have experienced the certain things so thank you thank so you I, thank I, you for acknowledging akanshi yes. ji thank uh, you so much because uh, my <laughs> heart i am thank really you. thank you so much for sharing thank you i can feel that thank you so much uh, akanshi ji the yeah. whole point of being in this space as i said and because when i understood that this was my life's purpose and how do i channelize it coaching it was the best way i found that i could channelize it and uh, this is the better side of the interview i yes. think because i now get to you know tell you about the good part yes of what happened yes uh, and i think that's the message i want to tell uh, anybody who has either experienced domestic abuse is experiencing or is going through messy divorces or is scared or fearful about such issues lingering around them observing them um uh, i i want to be realistic when i say this that i did not have a magic wand in my hand to answer the question on uh, how did i come out of it nobody has a magic wand about it we are all humans we all have our emotions and feelings there is it's, it's not mathematics and 2 plus 2 can be 100 yeah. <laughs> all right so at the in the beginning there was nothing like coming out of it because just staying in it took me more than 8 years um and again like i said the quantification of time when you go through abuse and you go through the resultant trauma is immaterial it's the impact of that trauma that you go through of the abuse that you go through that makes all the difference in how you take your life forward yes okay so whether you have been abused for 2 days 2 years 20 weeks 20 years it's really how you want to respect yourself to take your life forward and make a decision on what you meant to do now there are challenges now this is a thinking that one can have for themselves and i had a lot of challenges on in the judicial process and i completely respect the fact that there is a judiciary that helps us all and i uphold that however i did face my challenges because um, my ex husband happened to be a lawyer so he as you can imagine because you're a lawyer yourself and uh, due respect to that he was always two steps ahead and an abuser is an abuser is an abuser they don't change once they have decided that they want to be like that nothing usually changes them especially if they are of narcissistic personality so even if you are physically away from them they will find other ways to abuse you and the best tool for him was to do that through the legal process one because he was narcissistic and the other because he was a lawyer himself so i came under a lot of pressure and therefore although the walk away from the marriage had happened the walking away from the abuse hadn't uh so that stayed for a very very long time and for me i was literally just drifting literally just scratching the surface of surviving for many many years and i didn't know what tomorrow would hold i had no idea i had no plans i had no dreams because all my dreams were already shattered by then and uh, all of this uh, manifested itself in psychosomatic illnesses uh, a lot of social apathy a lot of unsolicited advice which i wasn't ready for a lot of pressure Abita. and considering uh, cultural conditions and if i can add this uh, i was fighting legal battles in two countries not just in india yes because i was overseas after my marriage so it, it was a bit complicated between two countries i can understand yeah and as a lawyer yes i'm sure you do i can, I can yeah. yeah so while there was a part of me who knew that this has to end logically it just didn't make sense uh to drift in my younger years like that to continue to be abused for somebody sitting thousands of miles away and for not having been cooperated by anybody from their side of the family at the end of the day my questions always used to be why me and i think that's a very common question for anybody who suffers not just domestic abuse but any kind of suffering yes um i think i fell in the same rut as most humans do why me 
And then I change the question. I change the question to what next? Somewhere the universe heard me and I think uh, things started coming my way. I didn't still recognize them, but although this might sound a bit abstract, things did start coming my way. And one of my very good friends first pushed me into some spiritual practices. And when I say pushed, it's because I resisted. And I was resisting because I had already seen so many changes, so many tumultuous changes. I was literally living like a gypsy for many years uh, between two countries and trying to find my standing and not having a, a regular uh, income, sometimes no income at all, a lot of, lot of things. Um, so I said, this is not going to work. This is all humbug. It doesn't work. And uh, I don't have the patience for it and all of that. But I decided that I'm going to listen because this is one person I trust. And why do I bring that up is because uh, having gone through all of these experiences, your level of trust and faith in anybody yes. literally goes into the negative. Anybody, even if they are uh, very, very good friends or family, you just look at the world as if they are your entire enemy. Uh, I mean, they are one big enemy. So after having gone through all of that, after having gone through many, you know, counseling sessions myself, having gone through all these psychosomatic diseases, hospitalizations, n number of medications, side effects of medications, and what have you. And I, like I said, I can have another hour of discussion on that. But the better part is, I did enter some spiritual practices. Some things worked, some things didn't. Yes. And when I started to find myself from within, what do I really want? Where am I headed? What do I value my life as? When the questions changed, the answers started changing. Yes, correct. And uh, that's when I decided that I will never ever again think of putting my happiness in somebody else's hands. And that's it. That day I started taking steps and I knew that it's going to be another very big, long, tumultuous journey because for these things, again, two plus two is not four. I didn't know where I was headed, but I knew the direction was better than before. And uh, despite the fact that I lost legal battles, I lost my sense of balance, there was still so much trauma, I decided that I do have to take one step in the right direction, and I did. And things have been definitely better. Uh, spirituality, philosophy, coaching. Uh, this became the most eclectic mix I could have ever experienced for myself. And I am truly, truly, truly grateful to the universe for bringing those little miracles, from bring, bringing those lovely people in my life who guided me better. And I just said, I don't know where I'm headed, but I'm definitely happier. Yes. And so I took each day as it comes, as it came. I worked on myself a lot, a lot. I just went inwards. And I said that I'm not going to be putting myself in that situation ever again. It was a promise to myself. And to fulfill that promise, I had said, I'm going to do anything that's legitimate to do and continue to do that. Whether it takes my finances, because it already drained enough, right, in my marriage and post-marriage and all of that. And I said, then why not working on myself? So I did. Uh, I pumped in more money only to work on myself and pumped in more time. I gave up career choices. I said, now this is my purpose. And I slowly and surely came out of it. And the day I started helping other people, I just knew that uh, the universe has given me my purpose. That was your calling. Yes. You said you didn't know uh, what are your plans and what are you going to do in future, but definitely God has better plans. And uh, he wanted you to help a lot of other women out there who are even listening right now or who would watch this video and with your work I'm sure you're helping a lot of uh, women sometimes we don't know actually that we are inspiring someone we are talking to somebody and somebody is getting inspired so um, uh, let's I think we are done with the sad part we are, <laughs> we are so happy that you are here we are so proud of you you're inspiring all of us let us start uh, talking about a little bit about the work as a domestic abuse coach uh, I would really like to know uh, what kind of a uh, 
work nature you have what i mean what is uh, what is behind it what what kind of a work you do sure let's just talk about your work a little bit yes now. let's get to the good part yes let's get to <laughs> sure so uh, see uh, like i said we make our mess our message and from all the understanding and learnings and skill development and the way i got coached as well i put together elements of what was required for somebody who has been in either of these categories like going through messy divorces uh having already faced abuse in the past or is currently facing abuse uh, of the domestic kind particularly spousal although domestic abuse per se is of course much larger and wider as you know but particularly spousal in this case is because that relationship has a completely different nuance and a lot of the issues that i've seen emerging which of course were mine as well um uh, were a lack of sense of self worth a lot of uh, self doubt a uh, complete shattering of confidence a lack of clarity of going forward in life and how and of course a huge deficit of self love true uh, and of course a lot of limiting beliefs as well because you may have been fairly confident as a person you may have been fairly clear as a person you may have been possibly having some sense of self worth already but a marriage of this kind can change a lot of things in your own personality yes and because you feel very controlled you you all the years that you may have invested in yourself before if if you have can also go down the drain you can start to feel very very um worthless uh, feel very much like a burden or a pressure on yourself is it is to tackle those kind of thoughts and feelings and to bring you back home is what i have designed my modules on to help people who are going through this abuse because remember one thing that uh, we're talking about the abuser more than the person who's abused here if you notice what's happening right you have images of the abuser you you know that uh, we are particularly talking about this because the abuser was involved in all of this otherwise we wouldn't have been talking about this but that's the point when you go through abuse the focus is the abuser yes when the society talks about it or when the family talks about it or your friends talk about it the focus is the abuser whether good or bad but the focus is the abuser clearly when you approach authorities the focus is the abuser when you approach lawyers the focus is the abuser when you're when you're in counseling sessions you know there's there's a lot of focus again on the abuser what did they do and how did you react and blah 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 and when you try to take a step forward in your life the focus is the abuser because you're holding yourself back thinking that i am probably not worth going in to make that decision of my life since your decision making ability also gets really squeezed out in a marriage like that what i do is while i coach i make the person who survives the biggest focus of their own lives turn the focus on yourself you are the one who's important not anybody else so i have designed my modules in a way that we work on all of these aspects so that the survivor feels that they've come home they've come home to themselves and i took a long time but one of the reasons i became a coach was to accelerate the survivors results so that they don't take as long as i did to come out of these issues अन्ना पापा को बोलो अपने आईफोन हट वो हटाएंगे पापा के सॉरी बेटा जस्ट टेल पापा टू स्विच ऑफ द डिस्प्ले आई हैव बीन लिसनिंग टू यू एंड रिमार्केबली यू नो रिमार्केबल स्टोरी वेरी इंस्पायरिंग वेरी इंस्पायरिंग um i'm completely uh, lost for words what you have done and how beautifully you have carved your life to do uh, support others um, so akansha yeah i'm you. so sorry rashmi ji actually my laptop got connected to somebody else's device i'm really sorry uh, no worries carry carry on yeah please so yeah uh 
as you said very well said that yes uh, we unknowingly or knowingly rdg we give a lot of attention to the person we actually don't want to resonate with anymore or we don't want to continue anymore but we keep on giving him the importance in each and every step of our life and then even if we end the relationship we as a women we keep on blaming ourselves only maybe as you said very well said the it is a lack of self worth so yes thank you thank you so much for uh, uh you know teaching uh, ladies i think they should now uh, uh, everybody uh, would be aware that what a coach is and how important they are uh, to make them because you know uh, we all watch a lot of uh, youtube uh, videos and we there is a lot of gyan out there these days even you know online but it is a one way communication you somebody is just talking and you're listening even i personally watch a lot of uh, such videos but sometime when they say something i have lot of questions to ask i have lot of queries but of course you know we can't do anything about it so yes i think people should uh, uh, feel the importance of having somebody in life as you said you had friends who are very helpful to you in your early stage and uh, there should be someone who can guide us through all of this and i'm sure that you are playing a wonderful uh, role in that uh, sense coming to my next question uh, arti ji i would really like you to uh, advise a young women a girls in general regarding a domestic abuse or maybe to realize that uh, even in the outer world if they are there so how can they actually protect themselves how can they feel or realize if they are being you know targeted or if they are into any sort of abusive relationship be it a friends husband wife boyfriend girlfriend whatever mm -hmm. okay um so the advice more than the advice it would be you know just conditioning to begin with that uh, yes we do have a certain type of culture and not just in india it's all over south asia or any other country where somehow women and uh, men role or gender roles are very specific and somehow all of this also gets very complicated uh in terms of what to expect in a relationship okay so again to each his own every relationship would be unique but there should be some kind of an alertness or awareness that a man or a woman you know because we're talking gender neutral also when it comes to abuse a man or a woman needs to be alert about any red flags there are typical red flags especially happen in friendships as well and once being aware of that one can also take a step back and figure it out whether they want to be a part of such a, such a friendship such a long term relationship or anything of that sort if they have a control of stepping back they might as well and uh, it's not that i didn't have red flags i did say that i did have red flags but the whole point was that i was too naive to figure that as a red flag Yeah. i could only put two and two together later that this had happened before marriage i chose to ignore it yes right and another part because why does it get complicated another part is uh, is because you end up being in relationships because you're mostly either trusting the person or loving the person doesn't matter whether it's an arranged marriage or a love marriage doesn't matter the kind of time that you put in the relationship before or after the marriage it's really about the trust and love and faith that keeps you bound so looking at it objectively does get difficult looking at it uh, with a you know with a lens that you want to figure it out whether this is even right or wrong and when someone else comes and advises you you tend to you know you tend to get angry or tend to get uh, you know how can you judge somebody that i have chosen for my life or things like that but the whole point is that even if that happens trust at least the wisdom of the people around you who who are well meaning and try to take a step back the other part i would like to say is that don't you know don't showcase yourself as somebody who is desperate or needy for a relationship because you'll be lucky yes if the person is truly caring and understanding but if you are in a relationship if you're running away from one and getting into another or if you're running away from something to get into this relationship and feel like it's an ideal marriage 
or an ideal thing to go towards. I think you're, you have a whale on your eyes. Yeah. So look at it as just a relationship that may mature, may have a future, but don't put your happiness in anybody else's hands. Be secure enough with yourself as a person, be secure with your own finances and be secure with your identity before you commit to anybody. I think from my limited experience, if that's something that helps. No, no, that really yeah. helps. Because yes, as you very correctly said that sometimes uh, we don't even realize it. Maybe a third person uh, can see it, uh, but we, we don't, uh, maybe uh, because we are so blind in a relationship sometimes that we don't realize it. It is because our parameters are very different. I mean, okay, it's all right. As you and me were discussing about uh, the mm. movie uh, today in, on a phone phone call, mm. it was about the Thapar. Uh, the movie yes. was two years ago. And uh, they have also, uh, the subject was really interesting. They have picked up a very, uh, they have made a very uh, a sensitive movie. But yes, a lot of conversations has happened after that movie because it mm. was just about one Thapar. It is a one slap. So uh, 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 some of the people, some of the women might feel, ki, okay, why to overreact? It's just a one slap. And somebody would like, no, how can be, a, you know, it, why it is even a one slap also? Because there is no equality in the relationship, as you said earlier. Mm -hmm. So yes, it, it, it sometimes varies uh, from your own perspective also. Absolutely. A very, very pertinent example. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, uh, yeah. Kancha ji, because uh, that film definitely has a perspective yes. it's not a solution but it definitely has a perspective every woman or every man should be aware enough to take their own decisions and figure out their own situations and even if they make a decision and even if that decision goes wrong accept it and acknowledge and move move because you need to then start figuring that there is life beyond that particular situation so keep making mistakes, but keep making those mistakes so that you can move. I'm not saying move on. Please, yes. please <laughs> check that. <laughs> because uh, I truly believe that nobody really moves on. You know, your hurt, your trauma, all of that, in a way, doesn't define you, but shapes a lot of other things in life, which right. helps you move with your dreams. Yes. Uh, uh, we learn, we learn, and we I think we keep learning till the time we go to the grave. And there's really not moving on. We don't really forget things. But how do we continue to respond to them differently? So as, as far as this movie is concerned, I think if that lady took a decision of uh, filing for a divorce only based on one thappar, yeah, um, to each his own. Yes. I think that's wonderful that that lady had a mind of her own. And there are so many others, unfortunately, especially in our country, who would continue to bear a lot of abuse till the time they die and they won't even report it. No. So they what don't. makes these two women different? right so there is a lot of differences in the way we make decisions the way we respond however when there is a red flag sit up and notice because don't let your trust and faith and love and hope for a future compromise on your self-respect don't let that do it yes as you said keep making mistake but i think we should stop repeating them we should realize so yeah, so my uh, next question to you uh, would be, Artiji, what is your observation about, uh, it will be a little off topic maybe, or a little different from whatever we are talking right now, on a male uh, domestic abuse. Do you have any views on that? Yes, it's very much on topic <laughs> because yeah, like I said, I, I advocate for both men and women. It is just that because more women are reported to have been go going domestic abuse the world over uh, and we, we continue to even address the problem as he did this and he did that. But yes, males or men, young men, older men, uh, senior citizens, all of them continue to go through some kind of abuse or the other. But if we were to limit... Uh, our discussion say to the spousal abuse as far as men, is, men are concerned there is a lot of emotional abuse that has been researched and brought up on data uh, about men undergoing emotional abuse uh, in, in India as well as a lot of uh, overseas however specifically in emotional data there is not no particular uh, I mean sorry emotional abuse there is no particular data that has come out but overall 
abuse in men you know latest statistics uh, in the us say that one in three women undergo abuse and one in four men undergo abuse so the gap is not too much so we need to understand that abuse very much exists amongst both men and women there are differences in the way they might project it to the outside world and there may be also a possibility that men may not even talk about it because of guilt shame male ego uh, the family repetition there are very different reasons why men and women may not talk about it in fact let's take a step back men might actually endure more you know women women can form communities women have friendships women are known to speak about this even if we say that most women don't women are known to speak about this in india we have a law that supports women yes right and only women but uh, men uh, i think would find it rather difficult and i feel that it is a, it is a problem that exists between both and should be at risk between both as well it's not something that can be related only to women and it affects other parts of life so why not address it for men as well yes correct absolutely uh so uh hrdj considering the situation we all are in uh pandemic corona work from yeah. home uh what has been your experience during this time and what is your uh observation regarding abuse and the and and the, the pandemic is there any connection have you seen uh coming it a little down or is it increasing uh, what is what has been your experience with the pandemic uh experience with the pandemic the world over yeah. as we know it has really had a topsy turvy effect on the world's activities it's uh, one of the things that the un united nations particularly un women researched was that there are some nine or 10 big areas that the pandemic has changed lives about for example unemployment joblessness unemployment uh, it's about relationships as well one of the major impacts that the pandemic has had the corona virus pandemic has had is on the increase in the number of domestic violence cases across the world so much so and the pandemic has now lived its life for over 2 years for us to now receive research and data around it and the data that's emerging from the un women says that uh, about 1 in 3 or let me just correct that about 52% of unemployed women have been facing abuse which is higher than the pre pandemic times at the same time 43% of employed women are also facing abuse so the gap between employed and unemployment women unemployed women is not too much as far as the aspect of the abuse goes and the un women has come down to the extent of saying across their study of 16 countries or so 13 countries 16000 women i think if I, if my numbers are correct they call it the shadow pandemic so we actually have two pandemics not one at this time in the world because the extent of domestic violence has increased a lot and the intensification of abuse has increased because the abused are spending far more time indoors with their perpetrators so it's definitely a dangerous situation for those who have already been abused or have started to get abused in india close to home the national council for women has uh, received about 200 and uh, 2090 odd complaints around domestic violence in 2019 and just after that the corona virus pandemic struck in 2020 the number of complaints that they got increased by 1.8 times close to 5300 at the national commission for women just imagine that you know the states must be getting their own numbers so it's definitely increased it's a problem that uh, needs far more attention than it ever it did does. yes it does right correct so yeah that's why they say we we especially in the cities like mumbai delhi or metro cities we don't happen what is, i mean we don't know what is happening the next door and when we see those numbers then only we realize okay it is in bombay also it is in delhi also it's not only the rural areas uh 
uh, when we talk about uh, cities like Bombay and uh, metro cities, I would really like to know uh, your opinion, uh, Aarti ji, uh, for a woman, for an urban woman maybe. And when I say urban woman, I say an educated woman, a woman who's living his life, uh, maybe in a metro city, some are working also, earning women, independent. We don't talk about it. I have seen it because as an organization, when I when we receive calls, because we have a helpline number and we try and circulate it as much as possible and we help them uh, legally or whichever way possible we can, counseling them and everything. But most of the time uh, when we receive a call, it is uh, we do receive calls from uh, 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 Metro City also, but they would just like to know what are my rights. I mean, if I try to step out of this relationship so my husband has this 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 property and he has a flat there he has a land there so what will i get or maybe what is mm. my uh, kids right so they mm. of course that's that's a very common thing a woman would they, they would want a, a financial security as well but uh, what is your uh, uh, maybe um, uh, what do i say what would your suggestion be for a woman like us who maybe under any pressure but they don't talk about it what should they do they don't want to step out of the relationship mm. but uh, there can be any reason but as an independent woman as educated woman as a woman mm. who is living a li good life but somewhere uh, in the corner they have a little abusive marriage how should they handle it what should they do should they come to you or i mean how how can they help help themselves Okay, so as I said in the very beginning that, uh, you know, the coach essentially works towards the coach's goals with the coachee. In fact, the coachee is the one who comes up with the solutions, right? And we help the coachee navigate them towards that. As I said, the coaching journey is not easy, but it's one of the best things one can do to oneself to emerge from a situation and walk towards a goal with your own solutions, with the coach by your side as your cheerleader, as your guide and your navigator. Now, when you said that these urban women don't know, they are facing a little bit of abuse and I don't know what the little bit means because abuse is abuse. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the decisions are effectively their own. See, abuse happens across social strata. You, you very rightly said that uh, we in, in metro cities, we shy away from speaking about it because we've been conditioned or socialized or to think the media projects it to us like this or Bollywood project is, projects it to us like this with due respect to Bollywood. But this is what a lot of us have grown up with that all of this, the Mardhar or the physical abuse or all of that happens in slum areas, areas. happens yeah. in lower socioeconomic, uh, you know, that was one of my my shocks when I went through abuse just taking a step back and digressing a bit when I went through the abusive incidents for me the first you know sort of first flash was that oh I've read this in the newspaper or I possibly saw it in some Bollywood movie how can this be happening to me and that for a long time I used to say that that you know really is it happening to me there's a sense of disbelief we yes. attached to it yes. as well so uh, uh, women may come to you with different questions depending on their background but the fact is that women from all social strata and whether they're educated or not, have a career or not, are uh, you know really poor or not, abuse can happen to anyone. And it is not their fault. Yes. It is not their fault. So I'm not sure uh, if your question is how, why, why would they come to me? Well, the reason why anyone would come to a coach and particularly to a domestic abuse coach is to find their sense of self again, to find their inner strength to know where they are headed and how they would be wanting to head there. It's about finding your new you. Yes. I found my new myself, new me in this journey. There was quite a possibility that I would have been down in the dumps, drifting still, not having a direction, allowing other people to make my decisions or allowing other people to still control my life. Maybe not my ex-husband. But I was already so down and out with my self-worth that I would have allowed somebody else to make a decision for myself. Right. And then I would have been unhappy even there. Yes. So the whole point was, like I said, that you decide. And if you are not clear about what you want, the coach helps you decide. Yes. Right? And then take your journey forward from where you are 
to where you want to be. So any woman from any social strata is welcome to the room. And this is the kind of cobwebs we try to clear in the room that it's your life. You are meant to be the focus of your life. Take responsibility for your life and your happiness. Start moving towards it in the direction that you choose to. Yes. And uh, coaches don't promise results. And I'll tell you why. You'll say, oh, you do all this work and you don't promise results. So that's the curiosity part, right? Coaches don't promise results. The reason is that I'm not administering medication, right? I'm not saying, say, uh, this is an antibiotic dose or take it for five days and your fever is gone. It's not symptomatic. It's something that's deep rooted inside of you. You are responsible for your own results. And that's something we learn when we get trained as coaches as well. Yeah. You know, nobody promised me my results. But when I started getting my results, I knew that all that work was so much worth it. Yes. See, it's like you always have a choice, right? You but, either you choose to continue drifting, take your life further downhill and further downhill and further downhill and still have that abuser in mind and they're having a jolly good life wherever they are. Or you just take the reins of your life, decide that this is something I want to do and start, start towards it. And the anchor that you have in that space is a coach. Correct. Yes. So again, uh, long answer, but yeah, anybody, whether they're from metro cities, they are from any social strata, they belong to any background, they're fearful, they're not fearful, they're confused, they, they have the clarity, but they want the courage. Yes. Any permutation and combination works. And that's why I have a clarity call with the coach, have a clarity call with me, and then we figure out where you want to go. In coaching, no one size, size fits all. And that's why I said, I cannot administer an antibiotic dose and say, you know, we do these five modules with you and you're out as yes. a sparkling daisy. We don't do that. Right. But yes, we have certain modules, which, which I know, for example, that they fit for the kind of people who may have faced abuse. Okay, okay. Great. Yeah, because that's why they say that if you don't uh, hold your own steering of your life, somebody else, else would take the decisions of your life. So Bingo. That's the one. Yes. Right. <laughs> Drive your own car. Drive your own car. Yes. Right. Then only you can decide your destination. Very Absolutely. True. Yeah. So I, I really don't think so. I, I'll be like getting enough of you, but uh, yeah, I know we are <laughs> short of time. I would really quick like to have my last uh, uh, query or question uh, to you uh, is Atiji, uh, how we as a community can uh, actually bring about a baby step changes in this domestic abuse scenario? Can, I mean, how can, what can we do? What can be a, small step towards uh, towards getting rid of this i'm i'm sure it is a very long process but how can we take a baby step towards this scenario so the one baby step is to be aware and be open to talk about it just the way we're doing it here on this platform and the reason I say be aware and be open to talk about it is that yes, even today, information is limited to the media. You will read in the headline about uh, coronavirus or some political party and on some side of some paper, you will read something about some judgment that has been passed on, uh, you know, related to domestic violence and all of that. We don't want to see incidental news on this, no. okay? What happens is that a lot of legal news does come in as incidental news and we become aware of it in bits and pieces. We become aware of it in patches. And somebody who hasn't gone through this or somebody who's not interested in this kind of a sensitive or deadly kind of news will actually not even read it. Um, so the level of awareness is limited to professional people like you who are lawyers who will always know or be updated about the law or somebody who is your client as a, you know as somebody who has faced domestic abuse or somebody like me who has been there done that and now knows and is generally interested because I want to help people so I'm updated but apart from that generally common people who haven't seen this problem happening wouldn't be interested and that's unfair on the people themselves because they don't know 
and this is not meant to be scary, but they don't know what if they land up in a problem like that themselves. What if somebody they know lands up in a problem like that themselves? And the whole point is, you don't have to go out there and start helping people. Just but just being knowing about it, just know about it makes you more sensitive to listening rather than make judgments or give unsolicited advice to anybody. Because this is a very fragile place to be in. Somebody who's abused is in a very, very fragile situation, mentally, physically, spiritually, in every way, economically as well, most of the times. Not all of us are millionaires. So, so the whole point is that just be open to listen. And I think a society needs all that kind of sensitivity. Just listen. And if you're not able to listen, don't go anywhere near the person. Because that's also another human being. Be kind. Just be kind to people who may be suffering and they may be suffering in silence. And for those who speak up, support them. Yes. And more, more, more than anything else, your conscience should be clear that you're raising your voice against something that matters to you. You can't be hypocritical about it. You can't be doing something in your household and then going out and, you know, speaking about it the other way because then your conscience will hurt you. Yes. So, yeah. So that's about it. Just be aware and listen. Start listening because listening changes opinions. Listening changes people. And listening changes the way you look at things. Uh, so no matter, because we're not taught all this in school and college. Unfortunately, we are. Yeah, we are not. We are not. And our our girls, our young girls, our our women, our women who are less educated, our women who are educated as well, need to know that talking about it is not a taboo. Yes. As much as you would heal a fractured hand, as much as you would you know heal a migraine, as much as you would go out and you know get some cardiologist's help, you can just go out and get a coach's help. Yes. And it's perfectly all right. Correct. And I think it's a high time, time that we all should speak about it, get help if it's needed. As they say, uh, uh, you know, if you, uh, that's why uh, there are a lot of taboo uh, regarding the mental health also. But thankfully, mm -hmm. things are gradually changing. Yes. And a lot of women, they don't talk about it. They don't uh, maybe realize uh, it. I hope this session will be helpful for a lot of women. This will be there on our Facebook page also. A lot of people would watch it maybe later on. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Atiji, for doing this, giving us the time. I know you're very busy, but you took out the time for this schedule. Uh, we are the entire team of IRW is very thankful to you for this interesting chat show. It was really informative. Uh, and uh, really, uh, bottom of my heart, thank you so much for doing this. And I hope that we should uh, collaborate more because uh, we do have uh, seminars regarding the uh, uh, anti-domestic abuse, uh, domestic abuse. And I hope to have you sometime on the panel again. And uh, I would like to, uh, Rashmi ji, to uh, say a few words. Thank you, Akanshali. Thank you so much. You've been great in hosting and uh, I am delighted. I get excited about this topic in a nice way and um, any little word that goes out there is service to humanity, is service to the cause. So I'm really happy to be here this evening. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Tashmiji. Thanks a lot, uh, Akansha, and thank you very much, Aarti. It is really indeed a great pleasure and privilege to have you on our platform. And hopefully many, many more women can regain their confidence after listening to your story. And uh, believe me, we are inundated by phone calls and uh, how to go and how to uh, support so we we are trying we're not trained ourselves in that manner but we would definitely want to be connected with you so that we can connect more and more ladies to benefit from your experience thank you akansha you were wonderful you. fantastic thanks to all those who joined us at inspiring indian women do join our facebook group iiw global as well as get in touch with our directors in india to join our whatsapp group this is an um, organization where you evolve, express, and expand. 
Thanks a lot. Take care. Goodbye. Just one. Thank you. Uh, Rashmiji, I'm so sorry to intervene like this. Just one, yeah. uh, uh, one small note. Everyone who's right now watching us or maybe watch this uh, video later, if any of you would like to get in touch with Artiji, her social media handles would be there on our page also. We will be uploading this video on Facebook. Uh, we will add the, all the social media handles, Instagram, Facebook. You can get her, get in touch with her. I'm sure she'll be a big help and she will change your life. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Aarti Ji. It was real. I, I'm really uh, delighted to have you on this platform. We are really happy. Thank you so much for doing Thank it. you. Thank you very much, Akansha Ji and Rashmi Ji. Thank you very, very May much. Your May your tribe grow, Aarti. May your tribe grow. Thank you. Goodbye, thank everybody. You. Take Goodbye. Care.